Hope y'all are excited and you've had a, a good weekend. And uh, my kids are in denial because uh, yesterday it was so warm and we worked on the farm yesterday and uh, my oldest was out in shorts and flip-flops. And uh, she she wore her flip-flops again today and she's like, what What happened? Is It's like, is God playing with us here or what? I was like, no, welcome to the last day of March. That you never know what's going to happen with the weather. You just kind of never know and there's times in life that we kind of get these little surprises have you ever been surprised by something you think something's going to go one way and everything's all good but then something happens and the next thing you know it's not so well well this is our experience yesterday on the farm as well i was so excited uh we had been um teaching our oldest she'll be 15 in june been teaching her about how to drive, and she's been driving on the farm and stuff, uh, the tractors and uh, the cars and stuff. And so I told her this year, I said, hey, we're going to buy you this lawnmower, and you're going to teach me that you can be responsible with a $300 lawnmower. If you can be responsible with this $300 lawnmower, then I can trust you with a $3,000 car or, or whatever. And she's like, that's great. One step closer, you know, to, to driving a car. I was like, yeah, so we're going to change the oil, get everything set, and, and it's going to be good. So she was all excited, so... The previous week, she helped me change oil. We did that, and everything was good. And so yesterday, we got done work on the farm. I was like, hey, you ready to mow? And she went, yep, I'm on it. So I walked with her, and so she was mowing, walking, and uh, everything was good. And I was like, hey, everything's good. If you need me, I'm, I'm over here if you need me. You, you keep going. She was great. She had her headphones in. You know, uh, she was just mowing. Everything, everything was good. And I'm at the front of the house hooking a trailer up. Uh, and next thing I know... She's coming, running towards me. Daddy, the lawnmower's on fire. Uh, okay, I'm thinking, no big deal. It's probably just the belt or something like that smoking. It's no big deal. So I'm just walking slowly around the house, and she took off flying. I'm like, okay, she's really concerned. But when I come around to the corner of her house and I look, the lawnmower is fully engulfed in flames. Okay, where's the fire extinguisher at? So we went to go get the fire extinguisher. We ended up putting it out. Uh, it just melted. And then she was like, Dad, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm sorry. That I, I promise I'll treat a car better than this. I'm like, honey, it's, no, it's not, it's not your fault. We often have these, these uh, things that happen to us. The thing but it is, is what we're going to do with it from now. We're going to take it and we're going we're gonna to learn from it. And she asked me, she's like, so what did you learn? I said, don't buy a $300 lawnmower. <laughs> uh, we learn. We learn from things. And church, we, we come to church week after week. We, we open our Bibles. You know, Tony gives us the introduction. We, we, we sing. Uh, I love that song that we sung up from Lauren Daigle. I, I love that song. We sing that. And just, I don't know, it just speaks to me. I, I love that. We, we come to church week after week. And if we're not careful, that we'll, we'll come to church, you know, week after week and week after week. But then we'll also go out the doors week after week, week after week, exactly the same. Could you imagine what it had been like walking... Uh, and hearing Jesus actually talk, hearing him speak these messages. You know, he spoke this Sermon on the Mount. And that's what we've been doing over the past month is going through the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' most famous sermons. Could you imagine hearing those from the words of Jesus? You know, at the end, every preacher you always, you always hear gives closing remarks. It's the closing statements. And Jesus did the exact same thing because he wanted them to leave his presence with something. How do you leave church every Sunday. It's the same way that you came in, or do you leave a little bit a little bit different, a little bit closer walk with God? Maybe a little bit better understanding of who He is and your responsibility with Him. I think that if we're not careful, we'll leave exactly the same way that we come in, instead of learning from our experiences. Uh, so like, for example, I'm not going to buy another $300 lawnmower. Uh, we, we learn from our experiences. And see, when we come to church, we're hearing a word from God. And just like this Sermon on the Mount, these people were hearing a word from God. Jesus was speaking and they were hearing a, a word from God. And you're going to come to church, you know, you come to church week after week, you open your Bibles and you hear a word from God, but what do we what do we do with the word of God? What do we do with what we've learned? And this is what Jesus is coming down to. What we're going to look at today is, is one of his final statements, his closing remarks to the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been in the book of Matthew, this is where this is found. So in Matthew chapter 7, if you can turn with me there, and we're going to look at this, these closing remarks of Jesus and, uh, and what he had to say. And I'm really excited about it. If you looked at your worship guide, you'll see you got the gates. And so 
I was pretty excited because uh, this gate, actually both gates are straight off of our farm. This one's off the barn. This is our chicken coop gate. So uh, these gates are all off uh, the barn and uh, off the farm. And I think it's going to really make sense as you look at this here today. This is Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 13. Uh, scripture says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life? And few find it. This is known as the straight and narrow, or the straight gate and the, the broad gate. And a lot of times we hear these and old school preachers have heard this, you know, like, Walk the straight and narrow because the broad will lead you to hell. And the, we, we've heard all these different, and no doubt it's all, it's all the same. And Jesus was definitely laying this out in his message and his closing remarks. Enter through the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate. So I brought a narrow gate. And of course, this one looks a whole lot different than this one. Enter through the narrow gate. And the emphasis that Jesus is making here is on the gates. The gates. Enter through the narrow gate. And then he refers back, okay, because the broad one, and this is a long gate. Because this one, though it be broad or it's wide, he's describing these description of these two gates, the narrow gate and the wide gate. And the difference is on the gates themselves. One's narrow and one's wide. Now, which one do you think you'd have an easier time walking through? I think that pretty much all of us could fit through this narrow gate but if you can imagine trying to carry stuff through this like if you've ever seen a dog trying to carry a stick going through a narrow opening and it just can't quite make it through there and sometimes we're trying to do the same thing one of my favorite things to do is to go to the grocery store and see how many grocery bags I can carry at one time and you're going through like this and you're trying to fit through the door and you're having to turn sideways just to fit through and the bags are starting to rip and you're trying to hurry and walk fast so you can set them up on top you have to turn sideways to get through it. So Jesus is trying to describe the gates themselves. The narrow gate and the wide gate. The broad gate. And what these really are trying to... It's like a picture to us is that these two gates, it's, it's a decision. And a decision that you're faced with not just every Sunday, but week to week, every day, multiple times a day, you are going to be faced with with the crossroad. You're going to be faced with some type of a life decision that you're going to have to make, and you're going to be at this crossroad in your life. Some crossroads are more significant than others. Which way do I go? Do I go this way, or do I go this way? All you kids, you're trying to figure out the long term right now, which way are you going to go? Are you going to go through and be a physician, or are you going to work at Eastman, or are you going to... Do this or do that. We're all faced with these life decisions. Are you going to have any kids? Are you going to have two kids? Are you going to have four kids? That's what we went with. What are you going to do in life? You're faced with these, with these crossroads. Which one are you going to do? These crossroads. It's a decision. And I guarantee you that you can already think in your mind of some of these decisions you've had to come in contact with. That you've been in touch with. The decisions that maybe it wasn't life-changing. But you're still going to be faced with this. Well, you're going to leave here today, and your significant other is going to look at you, and they're going to say, what are you going to eat? I don't know. It don't matter. All right, let's go to Arby's. No, nah, I don't want Arby's. You just said it don't matter. Well, I just don't want Arby's. All right, then let's go to somewhere else. Nah, I don't really want that either. Well, then fine, you pick. No, I don't want to pick. You pick. And you're, you're at this crossroads. And that right there is one of the most common struggles all couples have is trying to figure out what to eat. It may seem like it's insignificant, but it really is true. I'm trying to figure that out. You're at a crossroads. What are you going to do? Hey, the kids are gone. What are we going to do? You're at a crossroads. You've got to figure out, hey, we're going to choose this way or this way. These paths. And this is what Jesus is trying to emphasize here. These gates. You come across them. Which one are you going to choose? Short, the narrow gate or the wide gate? And this is a decision that we all must come to. And we all must face alone. Now, whenever we're at a, a gate, you know, that we're coming to, I'm usually picking up my, my kids and helping them across. The old ones, they can kind of just jump across. Of it. But what I used to love to do growing up is riding the gate. Have any of y'all ever, ever done that? You'd ride the gate? I got in so much trouble for riding the gate because we'd break them down. So if you never know, if you, if you never rode a gate, you got your gate hinged up on this big post. And what you do is, is that 
in our case, our dad, he's like, he'd be on a tractor in the truck or whatever. He'd say, hey, go get the gate. And I'm like, okay, I'll go get the gate. And so you unfasten it, and you just step on it, and you ride the gate to the end until it stops. And it was, listen, when you live on a farm, you find these fun things to do. <laughs> and that's what we did. We'd ride the gate. But what Jesus is saying here is that we can't ride the gate. You can't just stand at the gate. You're going to have to choose the gate. Choose the gate. Now look at this again. He said, enter through the narrow gate. So it's not that you can just stand at the gate and just watch everybody else go by. Hey, man, you going through this gate? Yeah, you're going to have to choose. Eventually, you're just going to have to, you're going to, have to choose which, which gate you're going to go through. You come to it, you're going to have to make a decision. Nobody can hop over it. Nobody else can carry you through it. You're going to have to choose. So enter through, you're going to have to choose one or the other. Enter in through the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few that find it? The broad road. The broad. The broad. Many people's on it. And he describes this. Many people are on it. There's so many different options. We've got so much. So like on the narrow gate, it's got a narrow path. So I'm going to be more confined. I'm going to be more restricted. I'm just going to be, we refer to this, walking the straight and narrow, right? This is what we refer to it as, walking the straight and narrow. And sometimes we think, oh, but this, I look, I've got so many more things that I can do. I'm, huh? I'm on the broad road here. The emphasis is on the gate, but what's important is what lies behind it. The emphasis that Jesus is making is that you're going to have to choose the gate. That's what you're going to walk through. But what's going to change your life is what lies behind it. Look what he says about the broad gate. He said, it's wide. The road's wide. But it leads to destruction. Many's going to be on it. Many's going to be on it. Not many's going to be on this one. Many's going to be over here. He says, if you find this, many find this. Now, these are two completely different lifestyles. This is a narrow gate with a narrow road. This is a broad gate with a broad road. This one has many people on it. This one here has few people on it. This one right here leads to life. This one over here leads to destruction. Now, so does it, we, don't, we don't like to hear these words. Destruction. What we like is things referred to as easy, comfortable, <laughs> something that's going to be calm, collected. I mean, these descriptions here, Behind this gate, what we hear is difficult. What we see behind the description of this gate is easy. That's what, that's what it says. Easy. So lead us through it. How? For wide is the gate, and the road is broad that leads to destruction. There are many be here go through it. How narrow is the gate, and difficult the road that leads to life, and few that be that find it. See, I think that we think that this often appears to be easier. I think it often appears to be easier. But life in general, church, is tough. Life's going to be hard. You're going to be faced with some tough decisions. You're going to be faced with some tough experiences. You're going to be faced with many different difficult choices in your life. Now what we got going against us right now is that our culture right now is trying to develop in us this instant gratification. We want instant coffee, instant results, instant notification. We want fast food, and we want it now. I mean, if you have to go through the PALS line, and it takes you longer than five minutes, you're griping. You're gri You're like, man, five minutes. And we start fussing. Man, what are they doing? What, are they having a conversation up there? Are they giving somebody's number? They're working. They need to be fixing my fries. Give me my Frenchy fry, and they can talk later. That's what we're instant. We're on the instant. So I did a test this week. And I hadn't told anybody, so you're the first one I get to share this with. I did it last Sunday. On my phone, I have some social media, uh, Facebook, and I have Instagram on my, on my phone. And all I did, I didn't remove it. I signed out. I just signed out. I said, I'm just going to see how many times I, I just go to this, or maybe how many times notifications really impact me. Now, I was still signed into Messenger so I could talk to my wife and, uh, and others, but I signed out on the social media. And I don't know how many times I would just pick it up just to check it. Just to check it. Just to check it. For what? And so then every time that I went to go check it, I forced myself just 
don't sign in, just put it back down. So I just set it back down. Just set it back down. Because it, we've got to so accustomed to instant, instant, instant. How many times have you sent somebody a text on your cell phone and they're not responded in an amount of time that you thought they should and you already start playing tricks in your mind like, they must be mad at me. What, what are they doing? They, they had plenty of time to respond. Like, I know what they're doing. They already posted on Facebook. They went fishing. I, I know they got time. And you start playing instant gratification. And I think that this is almost the picture of what Jesus is teaching us. Because instead of being instant, 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 what he's trying to get us is to look at the long game. Look, look ahead. Look at eternity. How many of us look at eternity? See, many of us, like me, like, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to retirement. Like, I'm I might be 80 when I get there, but I'm, I'm, that's a goal that's up there somewhere. I'm looking at that. But church, we need to even look beyond retirement. Because the eternity is going to outlive you. Eternity is going to outlive us. And I think this is what Jesus is trying to get everybody to look at. Hey, you just don't want to look at the short game. You look at the long game. Don't just look at this broad gate with this broad road. You need to look at this long game. But this is not what our culture tries to develop in us. They want to develop the short, the short game. All about the instant. How fast can you get it? I mean, I remember when a movie came out in the theaters. And you had to wait like over a year before it came out on VHS. For those of you who don't know, VHS are big cassette tapes like this. And you put them in a VCR. And that's what we used to watch. And you couldn't just start play. You had to rewind it every time. And it took about eight minutes. It felt like eternity. Eight minutes. And if you wanted to watch it again, you had to rewind that sucker again. And it would get so aggravating you when we want to watch the movie. You found it, and you'd be like, I'm going to watch this movie. And you thought, oh, man, nobody's rewound it. Let's just find something else. Instant. And I think what Jesus is trying to get them to understand here is look at the long game, the long term. But how does society play this out on us? See, a short term is like, hey, think now, do now. What have you got to do about now, now, now? Versus long term, we're talking about, hey, if you can think slow, be calm, be patient, hard work, pays off, cautious entertainment, get exercise, take the time, prepare your food. Instead of living for the now, live for ahead. But the fact of the matter is that you have a choice. If you want to live for the now, you can if you want to live for the long game, you can. And church, the culture is playing into this. It's playing into this. So I was telling somebody the other day that, hey, I got a gift card to Chop House. So, hey, you need to use that Chop House thing and get your, the app on your phone and make your reservation before you get there. I was like, make a reservation before I get there? Yeah, you just tell them you're on your way, what time you'll be there, and your table will be ready. And I, there ain't no way. So sure enough, I tried this out. We get to Chop House, said, hey, we're going to be there at 6.15. 6.15, and I was like, yep, Mr. Johnson, your table will be ready in just a minute. We go over to the corner, and it was ready in like five minutes. So we walked ahead of everybody else, and I was like, because I got to my table before all these other people did. And I was relishing on the instant gratification. You can look at it another way and think, no, I was planning ahead because I looked ahead to do that, whichever way you want to look at that. But we want to try to, we try to do the instant. The fact of the church is that you have a choice. You have a choice whether or not you're going to look at the long term or short term. You have a choice whether or not you're going to look at the wide gate or the narrow gate. You have a choice. And even our forefathers said that we have a choice whenever they pinned down the Declaration of Independence. So, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence, whenever that was written, this is one of the most well-known lines that reads this. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. That all men are created equal and independent. That from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. You have a choice to pursue happiness. It's not a right. It's not, can be, it cannot be forced upon you. It is a choice in which you will have to choose. Whether or not you will choose that pursuit of happiness. And the word pursuit instantly tells us it's going to be a choice, a decision that you yourself will have to make. What will you pursue? The narrow gate or the wide gate? The narrow or the wide? Are you going to pursue happiness? Or are you going to pursue this lifestyle? Because that's what he was trying to get them to understand this. 
is that there is always a price to pay for any choice we make. There's always a price to be paid. Now, which gate are we going to choose? Well, see, it's not just about the gate, but it's about what lies behind it. Now, I remember going to, like, the cattle market or whatever with Dad, and you'd always, they had these gates and everything up, and you just, for whatever, you instantly do this. If you're at a gate or whatever, and I, some of you can relate to this, others can. If you haven't, I encourage you to go to a gate and try it. It just feels good. Sometimes you'd wipe your boots off with your mud, but you're just doing this. And I remember being there with Dad and looking ahead. We'd be at the cattle market or whether it be on another farm and be looking ahead about what's, what's lying ahead of us, what, what's in front of us. On the farm, it may be about what we're getting ready to do that day, what, what lies ahead. Maybe it's a long term. The... Uh, you can ask the my parents, the only reason they had cattle was to put me and my brother through college. That was the reason why they had cattle. It was a long term. It was a long term game. It wasn't short term. It was long term. And what Jesus is trying to get us to consider here is eternity. Look beyond what you can see. Look beyond what you can see right in front of your face. So you're at these gates. And he's trying to get them to choose. Which one would you choose? The narrow gate or the wide gate? The narrow, this life, Jesus calls out and says, hey, this is going to be hard. This one's difficult. This one, it leads to life. The other one, yeah, it looks a little different. Get gate's a little broader. There may be a little more leniency over there. Yeah, that may be a little bit hard too. But there's a lot more people over there than there is over here. And these are Jesus' words. Both gates will lead to eternity. But only one leads to life. And you have the choice about which one you're going to pursue. The narrow gate or the wide gate. Jesus tells us that he is the gate, he is the door. But we have a choice to make. More often than not, we have a tendency to lean towards the easy way out. What's going to be the easiest a Polish Olympic weightlifter, his name is Jerzy Gregory. He's got a program that he's called the Happy Body. And in his program, he says this. Hard choices, easy life. Easy choices, hard life. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy. And Jesus said the same thing. It's not going to be easy. There's nothing about life that's easy. And I believe that we can have goals and dreams and we can reach for it, but ultimately there is a price that will have to be paid. Sure, you can have anything in life you want to, but somebody's got to pay. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus goes into this. I'm just going to read a few verses here and then we're going to come to a close because I really want you to understand this. At this time, Jesus had many followers and he kind of lays it all out. He lays it all out. Many of them were following him. And in Luke chapter 14, he says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And this does not mean you're supposed to hate your parents and your family. It's kind of a weird opposite way of saying that, hey, you need to love God over anybody else. It's kind of a funny way of saying it, but that's what it's saying. So, Instead of saying, love God with everything you got, he's saying, hate everybody else and love God. He's saying that we need to love Christ more. Do you see the hardness in that? Because who is the one people that you live every day for, that you're trying to get up for, that you're trying to work for, you're trying to provide for? It's your family. Who is it you want to please? Your family. Who is it you want to make proud? Your family. Who is it that you're trying to work so hard with? It's your family. In church, it's, it's difficult. Look at verse 27. He says this, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. His description there, bear, does that not just sound hard? Bear his own cross. Bear means it, it's on you. you you're going to be struggling. You're going to be carrying this thing. Bear his own cross. You're going to have to work towards this. It's not going to be easy. And what Jesus is saying, listen, if you choose the narrow gate, you're going to follow after me. There's going to be some burdens here. There's going to be some trials here. He goes on to describe this, and this is probably my favorite, it's verse 28. He says, For which of you, when to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? I love this. 
about planning ahead. You don't sit down first and calculate the cost. You're going to build a tower. If you're going to build a barn, you're going to build something, you're going to remodel your house, you're first you're going to sit down and figure out, okay, we've got enough money to buy this. We've got enough time that we can do this. We've got enough you know, time that we can really spend and dedicate to this. And what he's trying to get you to do is count the cost. Count the cost. And so many times all we're doing is just looking at the very first and not looking beyond. In our terms, we'll look at the new car without looking at the, you know, five years of payments. And I was told recently that you can now finance a car with Eastman Credit Union for 10 years. 10 years. A 10-year loan on a car if you want to. And if you're doing that, then great. But when you look at the long term here, long term. Term. And what Jesus is getting you to understand here is that, hey, you need to count the cost. Hey, he's saying choose me, but understand what you're choosing. It's easy to choose Jesus. It's easy to choose the gate. Like, oh, yeah, I'll take gate number one. Done. That's not it. The key is what lies behind the gate. That's what's key. And we just have, we heard preachers, hey, come to Jesus. It's the best decision you've ever made. He said, come on. And I was saying, like, yeah, I choose Jesus right here. And they're like, yeah, great, let's pray together. I'm like, yeah, I feel pretty good. I'm choosing Jesus, life is good. And then, bam, you get smacked in the teeth with life and trouble. You're like, man, what's up with this? I'm walking with Jesus here. I thought, I thought it was supposed to be an easy life. No, Jesus said to count the cost. There's going to have to bear a cross here. You're going to bear your burdens. You're going to have to go through this life and bear your cross. Through this church, every decision we make, every decision that we make, we're going to be at these crossroads and we're going to have a tendency to look for the easy way out. We're going to have a tendency to look for what else we can do. But Jesus is like, no. Look at the long term now. Long term, we're looking for eternity here, beyond eternity. This gate over here, it leads to eternity too. This is destruction. This one's life. Look for eternity here. Look for the long game. Look for the long term. And it's not always easy. There's a man by the name of Samuel Taylor Coolridge, and he was uh, a, had a brilliant mind. And some say that maybe not, if not one of the most brilliant minds. But the tragedy of his life was indiscipline. He couldn't finish anything. He couldn't go anything for the long term. He attended Cambridge University, but he quit to join the army. He left the army because in all his knowledge and all his wisdom, he couldn't grasp the concept of rubbing down a horse. So when he left the military, he attended to Oxford, but he left Oxford without a degree. He started to write a paper called The Watchman, and it went through ten revisions, ten different numbers before it finally just died. He had a very poetic gift, a very much gift with talented with writing, but he could not finish anything. He said that in his mind, he had a number of books completed in his mind, but not the first book was ever composed outside of his mind because he could not face the discipline of sitting down and writing it out. Anybody can choose a game. Anybody can start something. Anybody can say, oh, yeah, I, I love Jesus. It's great. Yeah, I love Jesus. Look at my gate. Me and Jesus, we got the gate here together. We're on it. It's what lies behind it here. What Jesus is trying to get you to see, not just the gate, but lies behind it. And see, I can relate to this. Our gates was more like this, going into our farm and, and on the barn. And I remember being little and being at the gates and looking at what lies ahead. Thinking, man, those tobacco fields are huge. Dad, how many cows we got? Man, that's a lot to work up. It's a lot to move. Kayla did this very same thing yesterday. We've got this, uh, so far we've uh, plowed about four and a half acres. And we planted some potatoes down here at this bottom. And then Amanda, she said, Kayla, can you imagine what this is going to look like when we get our corn and our pumpkins uh, all the way up through here? And she was just looking up and she said, Mama, are we going to be planting in all that? And Amanda went, yeah, we are. That's a lot. <laughs> Long term. We've got to think beyond. Long term. We've got to think beyond what we can see right in front of our face. The broad gate, the narrow gate. 
we have to count the cost. We don't want to end up like this man, Samuel Taylor Coolridge. Church, there's times that you're just going to have to just, you're not going to have all the answers. And you're just going to have to grind away one foot in front of the other. This is the way I felt when I was doing the crazy eights. And if you've ever done that, it's a five-mile run. And you just you get to the point where after three miles, you're just like out of breath and you're fatigued and all you're doing it's just putting one foot in front of the other. Like you're concentrating on not falling on one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. Church, sometimes that's what it is with life. It's going to be hard. You're not going to have all the answers, but you're on the way. I don't think it's about us having the answers. I think it's about us being on the way. The way. Church, John 14, 6, Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Are you? Like, have you nailed this down that you're on the way? Are you still flip-flopping back and forth? Like, yeah, I'm on the way. But man, my heart is right here. Are you flip-flopping back and forth? Like, yeah, this way I am, but after that I'm not. Every decision we make, every choice we make should reflect that we're on the way. Not the broad way. We have to count the cost, church. Is it hard? Yes. And you may be saying that, well, Jesus in his closing remarks, he didn't... He didn't sugarcoat this at all. Now, I, this is why I don't understand where all these TV preachers get it about prosperity. Oh, just come to God. Just confess Jesus Christ, your Savior, and money's going to fall from the sky. People are going to love you. Your spouse will love you. It'll be great. It's all a bunch of bull. Because if you start looking in the Bible, you're not going to see any of that. None. As a matter of fact, what you're going to see is the opposite of that. You're going to see struggles. You're going to see trials. And you're going to see people who are madly in love with God and walking with Jesus. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see. Church, we're going to have to toil sometimes in life. And because you toil, it does not mean that you're not walking with God. I think it would be more concerned that you are, or confirmation that you're on the right road. Yes, it's an hour road. Yes, it's not always going to be easy. But church, sometimes in life, we're going to struggle. Very rarely is anything going to come out to perfectness at first chance. At first chance. Ask your parents about their house. How many times they've had to fix little things or tweak little things. And my kids have already talked to me about that too. And they're like, Dad, I thought, I thought you were finished with this. Yeah, but I just need to do this last few little adjustments here. It's like with a house, you're never quite done with it. You're always doing something to it. Because rarely will anything ever come out perfect the first time. Like my wife is great at making cakes and she'll decorate them like, with all these swivels, and I don't know what the terminology, but it just looks like swivels and waves. It's probably got some terms. Fla they put like flowers on it too, like out of icing, and she'll do this with the with this popping bag, and she'll make it look really good. And she'll ask me, she'll be like, "What do you think? Uh, it looks it looks great." It's like, no. No, it doesn't. It still needs some work over here and work over here. It's like, babe, I'd roll with it because ain't nobody going to notice anything about that. Like, yeah, but I know it's there. She wants it perfect. It's not, it's not completed. It's not perfect the first time it comes out. I'm going to give you one more example. There's a philosopher, Plato, and I know he's a very famous and very old. He was a great philosopher in himself, and he was very wise. And he composed uh, this writing called Plato's Republic. And in the opening sentence, they found no less than 13 different revisions of his opening statement. And I'm going to show it to you here and I'm going to read it. 13 revisions of this one statement. I went down to Paris yesterday with Glucon and the son of Ariston that I might offer up prior to the goddess. That opening line, Plato, this wise, very wise philosopher, had 13 different revisions of that. Does that not seem, to most of us, it may seem like it'd be so frivolous. Why would you spend hours grueling over your introduction to this writing? Because he wanted it perfect. He was looking for the long term here. He's looking for the long game here. Something's going to outlive him. He wanted it to be perfect. He toiled over it. He struggled with it. This was the furthest from instant gratification. And sometimes, church, we think that if we're struggling, we must be doing something wrong. Church, that's just not the case. All you've got to do is look in the book of Job and you'll see that Job was a perfect and upright man. He didn't do anything, still yet trouble came. 
Church, I think trouble's going to come regardless of which road you're on. I think what the difference is, is who we're walking with. Who we're walking with. Most time you read this at funerals, I want you to hear these few words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the 23rd Psalm. Penned by a man in a struggle who was on the narrow way, chose the narrow gate, and he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death in church, you will be walking through this valley. We are all going to be walking through this valley from time to time. In the valley of shadow of death, church, what is key to us is who is with us. He says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's it. <laughs> He's with us. Time and time again, all through Scripture, you'll see that time and time again, He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but go with you all the way. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but go with you all the way. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but go with you all the way. Choose a narrow gate. Choose a narrow way. I'm going to go with you all the way. I'll go with you all the way. Jesus is telling us that he's got our backs. And if Jesus has got your back on the narrow road, I'll take that any day over the wide, easy place with the devil. But what do we struggle with? What do we struggle with? The struggle is what we're going to choose. Because every day we're at a crossroad. And I'm not saying that every day that you're going to have to choose not to go to hell. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying is who we're walking with. We choose life. We choose Jesus. We choose life. We choose Jesus. We choose life. We reject Jesus, then we're choosing this broad gate. I don't know where you're at in your life. But every time we come to church, every time when we come, we have a choice to make about which way we're going to leave here. I don't know about you, but whenever I come, it's almost like I get like at a pep rally. Sometimes I get a little excited. And uh, sometimes uh, um, Amanda, she'll tell Whenever we leave church on Sundays, we do the same routine. All right, girls, tell me what you learned today. So they're telling us what they're learning in preteens, and they're telling us what they learn over in kids' church. They're telling us this. Okay, that's great. And we're asking questions back and forth. And then I turn to my wife, and I'll be like, so what do you think? And she usually says the same thing every time. You did good, babe. I didn't ask if I did good. What spoke to you? Like I, I'm trying to please God here. I'm glad, I'm glad you think I did good, but what spoke to you? And she you again, she'll say, I'm still processing it. So let me, let me think about it. Let me think about it. Okay. What do you leave with? You're going to leave here today. What, what are you going to walk out of these doors with? I handed you two gates. The straight gate, the narrow gate, or, or the broad gate. And, and what are you going to do with it? Church, every decision that you face is a reflection of the gate you possess and the road that you're on. The gate that you've entered through and the road that you're on. Every decision is going to reflect the two. And this is what others will see. This is what others will see. Which gate? Which road? Which path are you on? Because when we do this, church, we're a light unto the world. And I think that we're a light unto ourselves. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us that we are promised that we are not alone. We are not alone. And you'll be saying, well, Peter, you've done a very poor job at making me want to choose that narrow gate. Jesus said, count the cost. And he's talking about how difficult it is, how hard the road is. We're trying to do the same thing with my kids. I'm trying to teach them that life's hard. It's going to be hard. Yesterday, I counseled a, a couple of premarital counselors getting ready to get married. And uh, I do these few exercises with them. And at the end, I was like, listen, guys, I want you to understand, be, this can be one of the best decisions you've ever 
you've ever made or it can be one of the worst. But just understand this. Life's hard. Marriage is hard. And I remember being all googly eyes for each other. And you just see it and you're all googly eyes. And I'll be like, I know you're all googly eyes over each other. And you think you can live on cupcakes and chocolate, but somebody's got to pay the bills. Somebody's going to have to wash the dishes and pick up the laundry. Somebody's going to have to put the clothes away. Somebody's going to have to mop. Somebody's going to have to do the maintenance on the car. This stuff's going to get done. You have to look long term. You have to look long term. Jesus is saying, I need you to look long term. Not the short game, long term. First, I want to ask you a couple questions as we come to a close this morning. First, which gate have you entered through? Have you entered through the narrow gate or have you entered through the wide gate? Which gate have you entered through? Because it's time that we nail that down. Jesus told us to take up your cross and to follow him. And I think it's time that we do that. That we take it for a cross and we follow after him. And we have a choice to make about which one we're going to do. Are you on the narrow gate? Are you on this pathway? Like, are, are you on this? And if you're already on this, then I think that what you need to do is what I do on Sunday. It's almost like you get a recharge. Like, hey, there's other people struggling here just like I am. We're all on this pathway together. We're all on this road together. We're not just going through it alone. We're going through it together. We're going through it together together and I think this is the part that we often miss about church and we often miss about walking with God see he said that there's many over here but he said we feel out that we feel all alone over here church that's not the way that it is we're not alone not only is Jesus with you but we have others on the road with you we are not alone we're going through this together we're going through life together we're on this path together you're not alone the things you're struggling with you're not alone we're going through this together and i think that we need to recognize that we need to recognize that you're here today and maybe you're thinking you know what i need to choose that gate i'm over here and i need i need to choose this gate then it's time to nail that down and to choose the narrow gate and only you can do that. Only you can do that. So as we come to a close, I'm going to do something that we haven't done here before. So I'm going to ask you if you would, for everybody, if you would, just for a moment, if I get you to stand up just for a moment. Just stand up. Super Dave, you go ahead and play something for us. Super is going to play this music, and I want you to be thinking about where you're at. Some of you are here today, and you're on, you're on this road. You're on this gate. But you may feel alone. Now the reason why I want everybody to stand up is I want you to be able to look around and see that you are not alone. You are the furthest from alone. You may feel alone, but you can't trust your feelings in life. you got to trust with what you know. And right now, you are not alone. These people that are standing up, we are walking through this together. We're on the road. We're on the path together. Together. You see the people around you? We're on the road. Together. Together. Not alone. Together. Some of you here, you may be looking around and think that you're an alien. That you look around and you don't, you don't know the other people. You don't recognize them. It's time to get to know them. It's time to walk together. It's time to be consistent. It's time that we can walk out of here today knowing, you know what, I have chosen the narrow gate. I'm going to ask you right now while you're standing, we're going to pray together, so if you would bow your heads, we're going to pray together, and then you're going to have an opportunity to respond. Right now, Father, we pray that you'd speak through the presence of your Holy Spirit right now, Father, we pray that you'd move, that you'd stir your spirit in us, that we may know how we need to respond. you continue to pray there's people around you there's people around you our youth pastor is going to come he's going to be standing right here in the middle you need prayer maybe you're on this road you need you need to nail this down he's going to be right here and he's going to pray with you you've got something going on in your life right now you're already standing up nobody's looking around nobody I'm telling you you need to respond which gate are you on which road are you on if you've got something going on in your life you need 
somebody to pray for you, I'm asking if you would to come. I'm just asking if you would just, just to come and nail that down. Maybe others of you got something heavy on your heart that you need to come and pray about. You can just come over to the side. You can pray about these things, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Some of you here today, and you're on this narrow gate, but maybe you're struggling. You're struggling on the narrow gate. We need to remember the 23rd Psalm that we're, we're not alone. That He is with us in that valley of shadow of death. That we don't have anything else to fear. We've got His rod and staff. They're bringing us comfort. He's with us. Maybe you need to recharge. Somebody's to pray for you while you're going through the valley of shadow of death. You need to come and pray. Whatever reason, you need to come and pray. Some of you may be on the, the wide gate. Maybe it's time to nail that down. Do you need to come and pray? I'll help you. Are you Pastor Dave? He will help you. Do you need to come and pray? I remember being in a similar situation where some of you are at today. And you know you need to respond. You just don't really know what to do. And I remember being so angry and so uptight and just couldn't wait until the church service was over. And I thought, man, if I could just get out of here, I'll never be back. And I remember this preacher stood up in front of the church just like I am right with you right now he said man if you feel that if you feel it in your heart that something's not right you feel it in your heart that something's just not right it's beating out of your chest he said that's not me that's not these people that's not this music that is my heavenly father drawing you to him I want you to come in church I'm asking you the same thing if that's you today I'm asking if you would to come I'm asking you to come and just meet right here. As you continue to pray, there may be some of you here today that maybe you've got something going on in your life. You just need somebody to pray for you. We just raise your hand up that we may pray for you. Just say, hey, i got something going on in my life. You pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. I see your hands. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody else? Hey, just, I need you to pray for me. Thank you. I'm going to pray for you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody else? Hey, would you just pray for me? we got stuff going on. Would you pray for me? God, we pray for these lives and these hands and what they represent. And we ask, Father, that you'd move and work in such a powerful way that they may be able to experience you in a way that they never had before. God, I pray that you give them wisdom and discernment that they may be able to follow after you and what you'd have them to do. And whatever it is, God, that's going on in their life, God, I pray that you give them the knowledge and the wisdom to do the very next step, whatever that may be, just the very next step. I pray, God, that you just continue to speak. Not just today, Father, but every day. Life is full of choices. It's full of crossroads, Father. And there's times that we don't always know the right decision to make. Father, would you help us through the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives? Would you help us, Father, that we may make the right decision? That we might be able to follow after you with everything that we've got. Father, there's times in our life that we've, we've made the wrong decisions. We've had to pay that price. God, would you just continue to lead us and guide us? To know that when we've made the wrong decisions, that we're not failures. <laughs> we've not been booted off the road. But you'll walk there with us. Yeah, though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. As you continue to pray, there may be some of you here today, and maybe you feel like if you're going through that valley of shadow of death, Right now, I'm just encouraging you now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand up. I'm going to ask you to, in any way, I'm just going to ask you, if you would, just to call it on God. If you feel like that's you, that you're, you're in that valley, that shadow of death, would you just call it on God right now? Just tell him what you're going through. Tell him what you're experiencing. That's what David did when he came. Father, I pray for your church, not just uplift, God. I'm praying for your church, all your churches around, that we'd be on fire for you, that we'd be pointing people to the narrow gate, this straight gate. God, that we'd be walking with you in such a way God, that it would be so clear and relevant that, hey, we belong to God. No, we're not perfect. No, we don't always get it right, but we are walking with the Savior. And God, there's times that we feel weak, times that we feel weary there's times that we thought that we can't go on 
I think this is the time, Father, when we need to run to you and not away. God, would you lead us? As we leave here today, would you lead us, Father? That every decision that we make, the words that we speak, the way that we raise our kids, the way that we treat our spouse, the way that we treat our parents, will be such a way, God, that would bring glory and honor to you. God, it would be like representing this road on this path. We choose life. We choose to live beyond ourselves and go for eternity. To look beyond, Father, what we can see right in front of us. God, I pray for the person here today. Let me feel out that they're on the road alone. I pray, Father, that today they're going to walk out of here completely different. Not alone, but walking with you. I pray, Father, as we bring a close to this sermon series, uh, Sermon on the Mount, as we hear these closing remarks of Jesus about these gates, God, may we not forget that we're reaching for eternity, but outlives us. So lead us and guide us. Lead us and guide us, Father, that the people we speak to, the people we witness to, the people we invite to church, we'll point them to a life of eternity. For this is what Jesus is trying to get us to see, a walk with Him. God, I pray that now, as we come to a close, God, and you lead us and guide us, may we point others to Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment to give God some praise? God, I love you.